So it's my pleasure to introduce you, Philip Wu. He's an assistant professor at the, in the Department of Cognitive Science at uh, UCSD. Uh, so even though he's in uh, the Department of Cognitive Science, he has a background in uh, electrical engineering and computer science, uh, an undergraduate from uh, MIT. And uh, he did his PhD in Stanford. Um, and his research area is in HCI, human computer interaction. He has done a lot of work uh, in uh, online learning systems, uh, online education, um, uh, different ways of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, uh, assessing. His uh, PhD was uh, one of the first systems for actually doing some programming system for data scientists, for example. Um, so I, I also came to know Philip for uh, his uh, extensive blog posting, which he did throughout uh, all of his graduate school. Um, and I think one, at least one, at least one of his blog posts went, went viral. A blog post about uh, you know privilege and what it meant for for his life uh, uh, growing up as a sort of an Asian kid in the U.S. Um, and and the kinds of uh, assumptions that people immediately made by looking at him, it, they thought that he was a genius and knew everything. Uh, so that what I, that that blog post I, I think was very very cool and went, went viral. So but uh, he's here to talk about uh, his his was work on uh, programming at scale. So thank you, Philip, right. for thank coming you, here much. finally. Thanks, Krista. All right. <laughs> thank you for preemptively clapping. Uh, let me get the mic on. Um, so we're going until three o'clock. Yeah. There, alrighty. So let's uh, let's do this. So I would like to talk today about uh, the work that I've been doing with students for the past about five years or so since I've been a faculty member. So I've been faculty for around I guess half a half a decade or so, and um, it's called learning programming at scale. So I wanted to start with this picture. This is one of my best friends from childhood. His name's Kevin, and he is uh, an oceanographer. So he's an ocean scientist. And a, a research engineer now, actually. He does a lot of uh, research engineering R&D work. So like you would, you know, the image that he would like to paint of himself is as this you know, person out on the ocean <laughs> collecting all this data, working with instruments, you know, all of this you know, very physical, out in the world stuff. But like, really what he does is that he just is you know, slashed out in front of the computer all day. Like he's you know, on MATLAB, on Python. He's basically analyzing data, writing code, building software prototypes. You know, he's basically a programmer. And I would say that like pretty much many, many, many people across the STEM fields and even beyond now are, are programmers nowadays. So what did Kevin have to learn when he when he learned programming? So he, he might have learned, you know, he might have you know, read something about algorithms, you know, textbooks on algorithms, design patterns, kind of software engineering type stuff, uh, or specific languages, right? Learning about the semantics and idioms of specific languages, C, Java, Python, and so forth. And you know what I want to argue in this talk, I think the kind of high level point I want to get across uh, to all of you on this talk is that learning programming is, is not just about learning to code. All right, so I would say this is what Kevin really had to learn. This is the dramatization. So here's what he really had to learn, right? So first, you know, he had to learn some programming languages, right? You have to do C++ to interface with devices. You might do some Python for some data analysis or some connections with low-level drivers. You probably have to learn JavaScript nowadays if you're building any kind of user interface because it's probably on the web. So, you know, along with these base languages, he probably had to learn things like Angular or React, kind of these application frameworks or UI frameworks that make it easier to build applications. So already he has to learn code, frameworks. Um, he might use something like NumPy, which is you know, matrix, uh, uh, efficient matrix operations, numerical libraries like Pandas, which is a, a layer on top of NumPy, which is a kind of a data science, data processing library. It's like TensorFlow, uh, things that go with uh, doing machine learning, doing stuff with tensors. Um, he might have learned about data formats like JSON, you know, kind of APIs kind of passing back and forth. You know, people used to use XML a lot. Now people are a lot of using things like JSON and YAML. Um, on the visualizing data front, he might have to learn something like V3 to do visualizations or Vega or these kind of higher level grammars. So he has to know about all this code. He has to know about these libraries. That's not all, it's not all right? So uh, there are probably domain-specific platforms and libraries. This is actually a thing that he uses it's a, a, for applied robotics. So kind of controlling <coughs> these autonomous robotics, these giant libraries you have to interface with. Um, you might use something like Jupyter Notebooks to kind of coordinate your scientific workflow and stack. 
Uh, you might have to use package managers such as pip for Python, npm for the JavaScript ecosystem, like Webpack for uh, doing compilation and kind of packaging and minification of your web applications. You have to understand how IDEs work, Visual Studio Code, you know, Sublime, you know, all these uh, Eclipse, all these IDEs, with all of their hooks into these kinds of package management and other kinds of tools. You have to understand kind of something about operating systems, right? How Linux command line works, right? Uh, you have to understand version control. How do, how do you interface on the command line or in GUIs with version control systems? And then, you know, we can keep going on. And nowadays, you know, so many things are being done in the cloud with web services and platforms as a service. Things like Docker and Kubernetes, where you were packaging up your application so you could scale in the cloud. And if if this slide looks like a, an absolute mess, that was sort of the point, right? That modern programming is like it's not just about learning a programming language anymore, right? I mean, modern programming, I would say, really is split up into three parts, right? It's learning code, of course, you have to understand code uh, fundamentally. I, I would also say that programming is about learning how to work with data effectively. Um, even if you're an engineer, you're working with data all the time. This is not just meant for, say, a data scientist or a data analyst. And finally, you have to understand how to work with uh, your computing environment, which is getting increasingly more complicated. So I would say that learning programming is about you know, learning code and data and, and the environment. And most programmers today, I would say, are what I would call self-directed adult learners. So, so these are people who are, like my friend Kevin, who are come into it as adults. They, uh, they have to direct their own learning for a job purpose or for maybe getting a job and stuff. They are not kind of what you think of as your K-12 or your college student. Even if they might have learned in school, they have to keep on obviously learning throughout their career. So they're people like engineers out in the field. Uh, this is a workshop I helped teach about uh, for digital librarians. So this is at Harvard a long time ago. These are librarians and information specialists who are learning how to code in order to kind of keep up with all this digital library stuff. There's all this maker movement, you know, people learning how to code to do stuff in the physical world. And then, you know, just traditional software engineering. I mean, there's you know, every company and, and, uh, and basically every major company and, and ecosystem has their own professional conferences, talks, online courses and everything, really to help keep training people and, and you know, keeping their skills updated. And so if I had to really summarize like the overarching arc of, of all of my research in the last five years or so, I would say that it's, you know, I study how self-directed adults learn programming and build scalable systems to support their learning. So this involves two components. There's the studying component, and then there's the building scalable systems component. And if, if you know, the kind of upshot behind all of my work, I would say, is, is the following phrase, is that self-directed adults need authentic tools situated within a motivating context. So what this means is that, um, you know, they, they really crave these tools that are, that are authentic. These are what people are actually using in industry, always keeping up with kind of the latest industry trends. And they need a context that's actually really motivating for them, right? So maybe not in a classroom setting or in a, in a, in a very control setting. It has to kind of be in the wild, something that they actually uh, need for their time. And I think this contrasts with a lot of formal education, say in K-12 and college environments, where I think a very different set of design guidelines might apply. Okay, so, you know, 10,000 foot overview of, of, of the work that my group and I have been doing is, like I was saying, on one side there are studies. So, um, you know, basically I would say roughly half of my work are doing empirical studies, interviews, surveys, qualitative studies of basically all of these people who are trying to get into programming from, you know, people who are older adults later in their careers, people from different countries, people who want to be data scientists, people who go to hackathons, people who interact in these, you know, Stack Overflow and other sorts of forms. So there's a whole line of work about empirical studies that is, you know, what I would call in the Chi world. Like most of these papers are published at places like Chi. And then the other half of my work are around building systems. So, um, you know, both code data and environment. And, um, these places, these systems appear in various uh, HCI systems type conferences. So today what I want to talk about is uh, our three systems. I'm going to give a, a, a broad overview of these three systems that cover kind of points in this design space of a bit of code, a bit of data, and a, and a bit of environment. And the first project, Python Tutor, is something that um, I've led. This is kind of my own personal project for, for many, many years. And I've had some students kind of help me out at throughout the, um, throughout the years. Second project called DSJS uh, allows you to turn any web page into a data-oriented IDE. Uh, this is 
led by my uh, PhD student, uh, Xiong, uh, who's a PhD student at the University of Rochester, where I used to work. Um, I'm still advising him, so he did a great job in this project. And then finally, uh, Porta is the final project, and it was uh, led by my master's student, Alok, um, who has since graduated. Okay, so first let's start with Python Tutor. Let strangers help you code. Um, you know, for those of you who, who have been teaching or who have been taking classes in, in computing, you probably really relate to this, right? These school computer labs are, are quite magical places, right? This is where like a lot of this really good interaction and learning takes place, where people are gathering together, working on problem sets, you know, drawing diagrams, working in pairs. Like this is where, you know, I would I would even argue like this is why like you know, universities like still exist for education, right? And, you know, we can learn all this stuff online and stuff, but you can't, it's really hard to replicate this kind of environment where you're running into people, learning from each other, instructors around and stuff. So this is the environment we really want. But the problem is that, you know, <laughs> sad people like my friend Kevin here, like they're all on their own, right? Like if you are not in school, you don't get access to this magical environment where you get to, you're basically sitting over here at a computer in front of some books, online courses, you're just kind of sitting there on your own and it's, it's really hard to kind of figure out what's going on. So at the very basic level, one problem is that no one's there to explain to you how anything works, right? So you might be able to read stuff from books or try out some demos, but like even something really basic like this, right? So we have a piece of code here with four lines, like very basic code. Um, you know, if no one is really explaining this to you or helping you figure this out, it, it's not intuitive what actually happens when these lines of code or run, right? And it's actually very, it's purposely underspecified because I didn't tell you what language it is, right? So depending on what language it is, this could mean very different things. So, you know, assuming it's Python, there's a certain kind of semantics that happens. So uh, the tool that I've, I've been working on over the past uh, few years, called Python Tutor, is uh, attempts to address this issue. So it's a, it's a website, you can all go to it. Uh, you can all go to it right now if you want, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to see that you're on the website. I'll tell you why in a bit. Um, so you go to the site, it's actually, <laughs> Apple not well named because it actually supports a lot of languages now. It started with Python, but it supports a t uh, about a half a dozen languages. So here's the code. You just write code, it's just the normal web thing. You hit visualize. It runs a code, it creates this runtime trace so that it actually allows you to step through and visualize this, all the runtime uh, control flow data structure. And you can go backwards as well because basically once you run the code, it runs in the server, it collects all the values and, uh, and it gives you back this, uh, this nice visualization that you can step through. So uh, here's kind of some design points here. So this, this is a demo for Java. It works for a bunch of languages. Um, so it shows the control flow. So it looks like basically like a single step debugger. So it's the mental model here. It's like a debugger. You're stepping through your code one line at a time. And then you see the stack frames kind of growing down by convention. There's active frames. There's local variables and, and static and local and so forth. And then you see these data structures rendered in some somewhat clean way. So it's kind of a linked node, you know, node list data, data structure. And there's a lot of engineering that goes behind this to basically make it work like as though someone was drawing on the board. So the design point here is, you know, this is not something you throw, you know, uh, you know, a billion lines of code at and you have it run forever. This is something that really tries to replace or, or emulate this kind of blackboard, right? So <laughs> these examples that you're drawing to, to illustrate specific language concepts very much in the small to really try to try to hit up whatever instructors are are doing. And you know. The design of this ended up being, being quite successful. I think it coincided a lot with, um, with the launch of MOOCs, which is, uh, you know, uh, the massive o o online courses, things like Khan Academy as well, Codecademy, really launched around 2012. Um, the project started going a bit earlier, but this is when I started recording usage. So this is the number of pieces of code visualized. So like every time someone hits visualize, we just record the code. And Python is most of it, unsurprisingly, because the tool started out as being for that. And you know, it's, it's over about 50 million. Uh, if you add all the other languages, it adds a few you know, tens of million. So like these are non-trivial. It, it looks not that big because just the Python is huge, but like, you know, there's actually quite a bit of activity on the other languages as well. Um, and there's a, you know, you can, can geek out all day about architecture about how all this works, but I'll keep this talk super high level. And then the other uh, piece of this is iframe embeds. So you can actually just easily take this, a snapshot of this and embed it into your own courses, into your own material, into your own books and stuff, and it actually just just runs on my server. So you know this is kind of nice because other people can remix it and take these pieces of code and visualization and just kind of put it like a, it's like a visual paste bit they put on their site. So uh, it's got a lot of usage and traction over the years. But what's more exciting 
is that there's just a lot of people using it. This is total lifetime, I guess, of the site users, just an estimate, just from IP address and cookies and such. Uh, I really like the map. Uh, I really like maps. So this is kind of a general map about you know how many people, these are unique IP addresses over time have visited. So like we've got pretty good kind of, uh, you know, all the major countries that you kind of see uh, have got a ton of usage from. There's, you know, we deploy surveys and stuff. Cool thing here is that many of these people are self-directed adult learners, less than five so, so you know, majority are over 25 years old. There's even you know one six who are over 55, which is why we did that older adult survey. Um, but like, you know, these are people who are taking online courses, reading textbooks, learning on their own. They don't have the benefit of you know having a physical environment. So, so this really, these tools really help them build these mental models. Okay, so that's cool. But you know, really the magic here at the labs are student interactions, right? So the student interactions is where really the magic uh, happens. And how can we think about emulating some of this online, given we have this platform that a lot of people are using? So to bring this experience online, uh, this is uh, the multi-user mode that started a few years ago. The idea here is, again, this is a Python tutor site. So if you know somebody, like a TA or a friend or a tutor, you can just create a URL and you can just send it to them. It's like a Google Hangouts. Basically, it syncs your sessions on that page itself. And it, uh, you just see each other's mice, I guess. And so, you know, uh, when you click to do something, the other one <coughs> click, you can kind of point with your mouse. You can chat together. So basically think of it as like a shared screen and chat uh, just within this web page itself. So it's very lightweight. Uh, you're not sharing your whole screen. And then you can like write code together as well. So. Um, it sort of emulates this pair programming experience of kind of bringing pair programming remotely. You can have more than two people also, sometimes about three or four or so, but then it gets a bit messier. But I think two is probably ideal for this. And then you can kind of go back and forth. So, uh, so this, is, this is cool. Uh, but the big question here that, that we had once we got this launched and then we got some people using it is where can we find uh, people to help out, right? Because the thing with the previous system I just showed is that you need to know somebody, right? So if you are in an online course, you might post the link and say, look, I need help. Here's my URL. Can some TA or some other student volunteer to jump in? But you, you still have to know somebody in the course or you, know, or, or you have a friend or something. It's like Skype. Um, but it would be really nice to be able to have this environment where people can actually help you who are around. So in a real lab, there are TAs or other kind of enterprising students who are roaming around who are helping people out uh, with their assignments. Um, you can tell it's a really old picture. These are all CRT monitors. Uh, their LCD is on this side. This is my freshman year of college, which I won't say what year it is, but uh, <laughs> freshman year of college. I, I was one of these TAs, these lab TAs. I was like a, a lab assistant. And then there's like a blackboard usually. Nowadays it's probably all electronic, but like, you know, the old school, I like blackboards. Like people will write their names on the queue and say, oh, I need help with this. And then like, here's my station where I'm, yeah, you can see people have uh, numbers on their computers. People write their computer number and their name and stuff. And then the TAs or other volunteers will go and help. And it's, it's like a really fun environment. So how can we do this online? Well, the cool thing about the site is that it has a lot of traffic. So this is a, 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 a box plot of uh, how many people roughly are on the site on average over about a year per hour. So this is Central Time US. So on average, there, I would say there's anywhere between you know, 60 and 80, right? So it goes up and down, but, and it kind of peaks during midday in the US. But the really cool thing is even in the middle of the night in the US, there's still a good amount of people because of all the international usage, right? So we get pretty good 24-hour coverage on the whole site. And these are, again, people who are on the site to be working through the site and to be learning. So these are, are people who are just on the site. So we thought, can these people actually end up helping the, their, fellow, uh, their fellow learners out? So this is the public help queue. This was launched about a year ago. So in this system, uh, notice how there's a queue up top. So you can just write your code, and then you can say get live help, and this will add you to a public queue. So this is you right here. Well, you is me, which is in California, right here in Del Mar. That's where I live, that's my home address, or hometown. And then anybody on the site, now this is some random person who's on the site, they don't know you, but they see the queue of everyone who's asking for help at the same time, uh, around now, with some metadata. When they click, they join in, and they just join into your session. This is exactly the same as a shared session before. So they join your session, you do all your chatting and, and everything. Um, it's the same thing, you can close the door so that no one else can come in. So you can say, like, oh, this person is helping me out, I'm gonna close the door, remove myself from the queue, 
a lot of people just leave themselves on the queue because other people jump in to watch as well. So, uh, you know, then we have this. So the big question here that I have, the reason why I want to do this is I want to see if this actually would work or whether it would be like a complete disaster. Um, so it turned out that, that with, some, with some design tweaks, I think it works pretty well. So I just want to talk a little bit about the design of this. Um, it looks pretty straightforward, but I think there are some actual design elements that are pretty critical. So again, the site here now, the, the, the site, I mean, you can go to it right now, you can see who's online. Uh, it just shows a little header up top, a banner that shows who's on the queue, but you can ignore it, right? You can just write code and do your own thing. You don't have to pay attention to it. Um, key element here is that we don't have any accounts or profiles. Um, one, just for simplicity, and two, just like, you don't want to moderate all this stuff, right? So like, when, it's just really simple not to have that. Everyone has a pseudonym just based on your, um, your there's some session cookie and stuff in your browser. So if you're using the same browser, you should always say, pretty much the same person. So you kind of have some persistence, but like you don't allow people to make their own usernames or, or profiles and such. Very similarly, um, it would be nice if people were like, oh, I would like to say I need help on this thing, right? I need help on this, you know? But uh, we didn't allow that either for several reasons. Uh, so the only thing we have is uh, location by IP. This gives a little sense of familiarity. It gives a little bit of character to it without revealing too much, you know, private information. And then the language, right? Like I need Java, I need Python 2, or whatever. Um, it turns out this is really important because, you know, whenever, if uh, anybody who's been on the internet, which is everybody here, knows that whenever you let anybody write anything on the internet, somebody's going to write something bad, right? So the key here is we don't let people write anything because there are thousands of people visiting the site. We don't want anything bad showing up here. So we want this, you know, no, you know, cross-site scripting attacks of any kind, right? Um, uh, and then it's a FIFO queue. Basically, it's first come, first serve. So it says, you know, who requested help. And then the key here is we demote people who are idle. So if you haven't been doing anything for the past three to five minutes, we gray you out and we throw you on the bottom here. And then you get active again, we put you back up. Because we know it's a bunch of people just ask for help and they go away. And then we don't want a bunch of, you know, zombie processes basically up there. Because for someone jumping in to help, the worst thing is I'm really enthused, I want to volunteer, and then no one's there. And then, like, you get really frustrated. So with this really simple tweak, basically there's always a few people on top, and then you can see who's chatting and such. Um, in terms of moderation, another aspect is that, the, so this is after you've, uh, uh, someone's joined your session, you can make a private, uh, it's a really long text, but uh, you can make a private so it removes you from the queue, so it, it basically closes the doors so and no one else can jump in. Um, you can also, as the person who asks for help, you can kick out anybody from the room you want. So only the requester can do this, right? Otherwise, someone can jump in and kick you out, right? So only the requester. It kicks you out. Another nice thing is that if you've been kicked out of a room, you don't see the person's request anymore. So like, so you can't like jump back in or bug them. And then you can just easily undo their changes. So if anyone makes any disruptive changes, you can undo it. So with all this combined, like it's actually, the quality is actually pretty good. I mean, it, there's been very, very little disruption. Um, and part of that is because it's a private thing too. So uh, here is, you know, there's a bunch of data that I haven't really had time to go through, but you know, there's been thousands of sessions so far in the past year, uh, year or two years. Um, this is a cool map I like. Uh, this shows a connection between two countries if, uh, if some session have, or two, I guess, IP addresses across country, uh, if some connection actually happened. They actually chatted for like a real amount of time. It wasn't just one connection. It was actually like a substantive chat session. So, so I really like pictures like this, just it's very evocative of like, these really are people who are strangers from around the world and like chatting to uh, helping each other. And, like, yeah, the, the world, there is there is hope for the world. Um, <laughs> like, this gives me optimism about the world. Um, okay, so the general, you know, first question people have is why do people actually even do this, right? Like why would people volunteer to, to do this on their own court? Um, so we did like a mini survey, like when you're jumping in, you can take a little survey. A big one is just people taking breaks, but this is very similar to what you see in the computer lab, right? Like you just kind of help out your friend, <laughs> take a break. You want social interaction, especially because you're so isolated, you're learning online on your own. It's nice to have someone else with you. Paying it forward was another thing that I really liked. Um, so if you look at the data, uh, about a third of the sessions have people who helped, so I uh, had to parse this, People who are the helpers, who jumped in to help, they had actually asked for help before. So this is clearly not someone who's like a teacher. This is someone who was actually on the site getting help. And you know, some of them even said, oh, like I wanted to pay for it and it seems like cool. Another one is actually like actual teachers. So they're teachers, 
programmers bored at the office, so this is a Stack Overflow crowd, and then like you know people who are retired or otherwise out of work as programmers uh, who have free time on their hands, and it generally makes them feel good to help out. The vibes you get really are this kind of intrinsic motivation, altruism, and this kind of shared struggle, right? So this is definitely something that we keep free. It's completely voluntary. It's self-moderating and everything, and uh, it's purposely lightweight in this way. Um, Here's just a really brief rundown of how a session goes, it's kind of very typically. So uh, you, know, you ask for help, some volunteer join. There might be some observers that come in. Um, at, at first blush, it may seem kind of weird that there's you know, lurkers kind of coming in, but this is common in chat rooms and other stuff. People just want to, they're curious. So you know, unless you kick them out, people just leave them in there. Because there's some stat here, I don't have it detailed, but like, there's some cool stat about how there are people who are lurkers. This is very common in forums, right? They're lurk for a while, and then later they actually jump in and participate. So we want to actually encourage this observational behavior. Um, then the volunteer just says, you know, what do you need help with? You know, uh, you know, how can I help you? And then uh, either it fails fast, so like some some percentage sessions, like oh, I don't know what's going on, or like I, I can't help you. Usually people are polite enough to just close the window and leave because then it shows that the room is empty, so then someone else can try it later. But usually once it actually picks up and goes, um, people actually end up chatting. And, and the key here is that the visualizations act as the scaffold here. So like, you know, there's a lot of statements like this where they're actually talking about the visualization. I think this is where the visualizations come in handy, right? Because if you just have a bunch of code, it's actually very hard to talk through it. You just say, oh, print F this or print F this and just like print a bunch of stuff. But you have the diagram here. You're actually talking about the diagram you're pointing to the diagram. I think this is where the real magic behind the system is. And then, uh, you know, if, if they get the resolution to their bug and stuff, say things. And then the really fun thing here I like is this post-resolution small talk, right? So, like, they would ask about additional resources. Like, oh, like, do you have other stuff I should read or other links? Or, or like, people would offer, like, oh, you should look into this or look into that. Um, so people give, like, life or career advice. Like, oh, you know, what are you majoring in? You know, what are you hoping to do? And then sometimes people actually exchange their contact info. I mean, it's voluntary. You don't have to. But some people are like, oh, can we connect on Skype or something? Can I email you some more questions? And, like, people actually exchange info. I mean, this is completely private otherwise, right? Um, so the thing I really want to contrast this with before I finish this section is uh, with Stack Overflow. So, you know, something like Stack Overflow or a, or a moderated discussion form or Q&A site, you know, they've been able to keep question quality high relatively because they have actually really strict rules in moderation. Like, it's like, if you're new to Stack Overflow, it can be really scary because like someone's going, oh, you didn't follow rule 3B. Wikipedia is the same way, right? Like, these online communities are extremely strict because they want to be a curated collection of, of answers. And I think that the chat, this kind of chat system can be potentially better than these forums for, for those reasons, right? One is you can refine vague questions really easily. You go back and forth really easily, whereas on Stack Overflow, you just like get yelled at. Um, you can build rapport, right? So this off-topic small talk is actually, you know, something you can actually do. Because, you know, Stack Overflow especially and, and Wikipedia and stuff, like, they, they don't want you to, to banter, right? They want you to stick on topic. Um, volunteers also felt immediately appreciated because you can just get immediate kind of gratification. Um, it's also private and ephemeral. Like there's no, you know, log trace of this. This is a, you know, this basically means there's no spam, there's no trolling, there's no real incentive for someone to post bad stuff because like no one else is going to see it. Um, you know, another question you might be wondering is, do people actually learn anything? And um, you know, of course, we don't know whether they actually learn anything because we just see their chats. But from their chats, we did this kind of discourse analysis. And like, it turns out that they actually learned, you know, gave some indicators that they, they, uh, they got some understanding in the lower three levels of Bloom's taxonomy. So this is a taxonomy of kind of sophistication of learning, and it kind of goes up. So remembering stuff is a lot of times about syntax and mechanics, which, you know, for all of you here who are experienced programmers, might seem trivial, but for it's something that trips up beginners a lot, right? So even remembering the syntax, you know, just little things like that that uh, someone can just correct you on is really important. I would say understanding is about semantics, so understanding the mental models of how languages, um, uh, programming languages work. And then application is, you, know, you sometimes see these cases of saying, okay, I have a few problems to try. I'm going to try this. Let's try another one that's similar and, and kind of see if you transfer your, your knowledge. So in sum, uh, the thing with the Python tutor is that I think that the cool thing here is that the shared motivating context, which is this you know, environment we're all trying to learn at the same uh, time, even though we're in a different place, plus these visualizations that are, that, are, that are supposed to be really accurate to what people are, are learning, this gives rise to this ability to give anonymous live help that, uh, that, that I, I have not seen much 
in other places. Um, it's a kind of a very unique affordance that's different than, say, Stack Overflow or a discussion forum. All right, any quick questions on this before we move on to the next section? I can, I, we can do questions afterwards as well, but any quick, yes? Why not audio? Why not audio? Um, some people wanted, I mean, or video and stuff. I think part of it initially was just bandwidth. Also, my, I, got, I don't have a, any proof of this, but I think that people will be more self-conscious to do audio with a stranger than the text. That's just my own just gut intuition that I wouldn't want to do audio with a stranger, but text may be okay. Any other quick questions? Yep. If someone's kicked out of a room unfairly, is there any appeal process for that? Yeah, so <coughs> kicked out unfairly, there isn't really. Um, yeah, I mean, we kept this fairly lightweight. I mean, another design point is that like there's nobody actually <laughs> maintaining the system, so we couldn't really have any good moderation. We just let people self-moderate. So yeah, so you know, all of this we have not built in. Uh, what, can we do one more? Uh, yeah. Uh, do you not? Do you have any number of percentage in people who ask for help and they just got any reply? Oh, didn't get anything. Yeah. Um, there's a graph somewhere. I don't have this up time. The basic gist is, if you're willing to wait long enough, someone will come help you. The most of the people who don't get help is because they don't wait that long. Like if you wait, you know, I think if you wait more than five or ten minutes, somebody will run into it. You know, they may not be great, but they'll at least try. Um, but I think the total numbers, I don't have a great, great number. Okay, so let's move on to part two. Part two and three are going to be a little bit shorter. So, part two is DSJS. So, uh, let's change gears a little bit to talk about uh, data now. So, uh, this is the kind of, you know, uh, landscape of what, what my friend Kevin has to deal with in his programming, kind of hypothetical landscape. So, you know, one way you can imagine data flowing is that he has some uh, devices that are physical. You know, these are uh, underwater robots that collect information in the ocean. It pipes into some low-level driver. This might go interface with C++, and then this might, you know, go to some machine learning libraries and such, communicate through an API. I mean, this is getting kind of contrived, but, you know, communicate through an API with something like Python that, that uses a processing, and then it goes, you know, the API also drives a front end, right? I mean, it's not that ridiculous nowadays. Um, because, you know, you have these multi-component systems. And I would say here that, like, I think that modern programming, I mean, just programming in general, right, this seems kind of obvious, right? I mean, you're using code to manage data, like data structures in your code. But really, I think nowadays people are using programming to manage data in the large. I think that programmers are turning to what I call end user data scientists, right? That uh, in order to be a good programmer nowadays in a lot of fields, you, know, you have to understand how to measure performance, to profile it, to optimize. You have to collect usage metrics, deployment in the field, do A-B testing. You have to understand basically how to play with data uh, really well. Um, you know, you're, you're not just programming something in isolation. All of your stuff touches data all the time. So. Um, and I, that's why I think that learning basic data science is critical for, uh, for being a modern programmer nowadays. So how do people now learn data science? So mostly people are using environments, IDEs like uh, R Studio, Jupyter Notebooks, MATLAB, these monolithic IDEs uh, on their desktop, and you're bringing pieces of data into the coding environment, right? So you have something like CSV files, you're importing into a data environment, you're, uh, you're hooking up the database, you're hooking up with you know, NoSQL, you're hooking up with uh, you know, API calls that you're grabbing from the web. You're stuffing everything into this IDE and then playing with it. Um, some issues with this, uh, especially for learners, for people who are starting out, is that there's all those installation and configuration issues. You have to manage databases, you have to manage software packages, you have to understand the command line to kind of understand how to play with data, to kind of put stuff in, you have to understand file systems. All these things, again, you know, as experienced programmers, you kind of do second nature, but th there are a lot of barriers for beginners to get through. Another thing is that the code and data are disconnected, right? So code is one place, it's in the ID, my data is somewhere in databases, a bunch of files strewn of everywhere, they're remote APIs. They're all managed separately, and these IDEs are just not meant for teaching or for learning, right? They're, they're meant for production use. So the, the twist behind this project, my student's project, is what if we could reverse this? What if we could bring code uh, directly to data instead of bringing data into code, right? So this is data bring to your code. What if we could bring code to your data? So what this means is that, um, what this means in practice is that uh, we are gonna use the web as the source of data because like the web is, just has data just up the wazoo, right? So there's Wikipedia, it's like a simple example. You have data tables here. You can imagine like there are CSV files everywhere in the web. There's, you know, 
you know, JSON files, just just data everywhere on the web. Um, and what this system does, it turns any web page into an IDE for playing with data. So here is a demo of how it works. So this is Wikipedia, just the web page. Uh, so if you go to a web page, any web page, and you find some data tables you like, uh, you click on this uh, extension thing, it's bookmarklet, and then it lets you add an editor onto the table. So what just happened here really fast was um, I clicked on this bookmarklet, which is basically it injects some JavaScript code into the web page. So it injects JavaScript, our library, into any web page. It allows you, and it basically parses all the tables that it can recognize that have you know, values in it, such as this HTML table here. Then you can put an editor in here, and then this editor, this T7, I guess there's a bunch that's been created before. This is actually is the parse table. So that actually is that data. It's just kind of in a parse format. So this is in a data structure now. So the cool thing now is that you can now write code to just process your data. So the data can come from HTML tables. It can also come, our prototype is HTML and CSV. So a lot of websites just link to CSV files, like government data and stuff. So if you can find it in any web page, you can just click this extension, and then you can just, it just gives you a coding environment right on the web page. Um, it's JavaScript because it runs on the web page, but nowadays JavaScript libraries can do anything, right? You can do visualization, you can do machine learning, you can do uh, data processing, um, they're like GPU enhanced, you can just do anything with JavaScript now. So you can import whatever libraries you want and just start munging the data on the page. To help you out, we have a nice API. So if you want to use our API, uh, we have a very simple data processing library that gives you these nice visual previews. So it gives you previews like if you can click on the data table, this is the table, it will give you the API function calls that are eligible. So if you select two columns, you can do a bar plot, and it generates the code and then it also gives you the plot. So like, I didn't show all this, but you can just basically do any kind of SQL type operation, slicing, dicing, filtering, plotting, you know, comparisons and stuff. So you can both, uh, you know, write the code manually or you can select it and then have the code kind of written for you kind of as a, it's kind of a backwards Python tutor like thing, right? You can select the, the image and it gives you the code. You can also preview the other way. So let's say you have a bunch of uh, code in a pipeline like this. This is like a basketball table. You can also highlight over any part of your code, and it will uh, kind of incrementally run that part and show you the results. So this is a filter operation. This is a, actually not the filter, that was a drop column. This is a filter, and this is a group by that groups two tables into one. So the idea there is that, it, again, it's scaffolding to help learners who are starting to play with data to see what's going on you know, while, they're, while they're coding. So if you don't have this, you just have to like write all your code by hand and print everything out. Again, it's very similar to Python Tutor in that. It's like a Python tutor for data-oriented operations. So, you know, very briefly, uh, since we're running a short time, I just want to contrast the desktop setup with uh, DSJS. So, in a desktop setup, you have to install all this IDEs, you have to do all this Unix-y stuff, all this family stuff. Here is like, it's super simple, right? Anybody, it, you know, there's actually not even an extension. It's called a bookmark play, which means you just literally bookmark our site, and when you click on it, it just injects JavaScript into the page, um, because that's, that's just how, um, uh, the permissions work out perfectly fine because it's all running within the context of that page. Um, you know, in a traditional system, the code and data are disconnected, right? You manage them all separately, databases, files. The cool thing here is that everything's together within the page, right? It's within this authentic context of the page. Like, I want to play with Wikipedia data about, geo I don't know, population growth. I'm playing with it on the page itself. And the cool thing, which I didn't even show, is that there's a URL you can just share with someone that actually packages it all up. It's just, it's just the page itself, just basically enhancing the web page with your own code. Uh, finally, these IDs are just not designed for pedagogy at all. So we designed this API to be very novice friendly. We have this visualizations like the Python tutor. So visualizations to help people out um, with visual scaffolding. So this is a system that, that, um, that my student made. So I'm gonna, we'll do questions that I'm gonna finish up with the last section, which is called Seeing Through Expert Blind Spots. Okay, so Let's step back again and think about the you know messy giant uh, landscape. So, you know you can imagine someone like my friend Kevin having to learn multiple programming languages, which is not unusual nowadays, right? Because you have to have some front end, you have to have some data processing, you have some kind of drivers to, to hook up with say hardware. But I think learning this is still not enough. You know, it's still it's hard enough to to learn basic languages and frameworks. But that, I think that what a lot of learners do is they hit what I call the cliff. Um, I don't know a better name for this, but, but I, I just made this up. So what the cliff is, is that like 
you can learn all you know, all you want. I mean, you can become like the master of C++ or Python or JavaScript. But like, there's like such a barrier to what real stuff you can build unless you do this, right? Like, unless you actually start to understand and work with all of this grimy infrastructure and environment of you know these libraries and package managers and you know intricacies of deployment environments and command line and stuff. It's just really hard to build anything kind of realistic. And I think it, the problem is getting worse and worse uh, nowadays. You know, as programming becomes more powerful and more accessible, it's just, it's just harder and harder to run from this stuff. Like these abstractions are so leaky, you just can't hide from this stuff. So I think that now programmers are increasingly what I call their end user system administrator. Like back in the days, you could write your code and maybe you have system ins or DevOps people take care of all this. Nowadays, yes, if you can hire your own folks to do this, that's great. But a lot of people just have to understand and do that on their own. And it's because the environment that code runs on is just getting more and more complicated. And this is something that, that is just, you know, I think it's exponentially getting worse. So how do people deal with this, right? So they basically are reading tutorials on the internet. There are not really any textbooks to deal with this because stuff changes so fast. You're reading a tutorial about Docker, Amazon, TensorFlow, Pip. You know, every single combination of buzzwords you want to throw on here. There's some tutorial for Webpack, Visual Studio Code. Webpack, ES2, Angular, whatever, like, there's just tutorials everywhere. So I'm sure anybody who's been, you know, building modern software has had to read through these tutorials. And one problem is that these tutorial websites are, like, extremely buggy and error prone. Um, they're extremely, extremely error prone. And it's not because people are bad at writing tutorials, it's because, of, because software environment is so complicated. The first one is that the learner's environment probably is different than the tutorial creator's environment. This is, like, Absolutely hard. Like if you've tried, like if you're t teaching a class and you try to write, like here's how you set up this on your system, you know, with 300 students, somebody's gonna be like, I have you know Windows Vista or something, or I have some old version of Windows, or like I'm not allowed to set this up, or my Mac upgraded itself, and like this doesn't work. It's because everyone's environments are so different. The other one is even more frustrating is that like you know operating systems, libraries, they get updated so fast. So like your tutorial probably has some weird part that doesn't work next month or next year. Um, then there's also this idea of an expert blind spot, right? So if you're an expert, you often have this blind spot that you don't think about saying certain things in your tutorial. You don't phrase the things in a certain way because you don't really remember what it was like to be a beginner. Um, so the worst part here, again, is that like when people make these tutorials, they may be really well intentioned. You know, they put these up on the web or whatever, but they can't really see what's going wrong when people are trying to follow the tutorial. It's really just, you're just throwing your tutorial up on the web and that's it. Maybe someone complains to you in a forum or in an email, but like, you don't really get much feedback. So the question here behind this project is, um, can we help the creator see through their blind spots? And then can we show them precisely where learners are struggling when they're following these tutorials that are just in the wild? And the way we do this is with a system that's uh, uh, called Porta, which uh, does two things. It first records how learners follow a tutorial. So it just basically is like a web recorder that records while you're following this tutorial web page, where are you scrolling to, where are you hovering over, what are you doing? And the second part is, the essential part here is what else they're running on their computer. It, it, it's recording other activities on their computer as well. So here's how it works. So uh, basically, how it works is that you have a tutorial web page. This is one from an intro class that we taught. It's a bunch of uh, web development you know, uh, modules. So here's the web page of a tutorial. It just has a bunch of text, sample code, some videos on the side, and you know, so like here's some instructions, do this, click on this thing, here's a video you can watch. Very typical of say web development or system and sort of stuff. Um, so here is what happens when someone is running the tutorial with the Porta extension installed. So I uh, imagine I'm a, I'm a student in the class and, and I, I run this, or I'm a user tester. Um, what the system does is it records a screencast video of me using the system. That's pretty straightforward. It just records my screen. That's, that's good. But the key thing here is it records a bunch of metadata as well. Uh, and the metadata is used to actually uh, fragment a, a segment of video. So the metadata here first is mouse position, so just kind of metadata about where your mice is at all times. Um, we know about your browser, so we know what browser tabs you have open, where they are, videos, whether you're playing the videos, scrubbing through the videos the JavaScript console, whether there's any errors, whether you're playing with stuff in JavaScript and stuff. So we record a bunch of browser activity. The other thing is we go off the browser, right? So we record stuff that you can do in your IDE, such as running compilers or interpreters or build tools. 
Um, this is not just for Visual Studio Code. Actually, it doesn't have anything to do with the idea. It just we wrap uh, we wrap the tool chain executables in just this just a wrapper. So like GCC, for example, you can invoke it through any ID, and it will record arguments and, and you know what files it's compiling, what files it's outputting, and stuff. So we record all the stuff you're doing while you're coding, and then we record terminal actions, right? So uh, bash. Other shells, we just kind of interpose in the shells. So we record the fact that you ran package managers or or um, or packing tools or compilers and stuff. So we record all of this activity about what you're doing. And what's the result of all this? The result is that we create what's called a tutorial profiling visualization. So the analogy here is to code profiling, right? So like in a code profile or a software profile, you run your code and you see the hot spots of where the code is spending a lot of time. So this is the exact same idea except we're doing it over the entire uh, coding tutorial. So uh, the, basically the visualization, the simplest form is it looks like a heat map. It just says, look, someone lingered over this slide for a while and they did something. So uh, if you actually scroll through, the visualization at the most basic level has a bunch of options, but it's really just the original web page with a heat map on the side. So now as the tutorial creator, we can see, look, everyone was lingering over that. Well, that slide is really red. Why did everyone go on that slide? And then you can zoom in to see what people were doing when they were on a specific part of the tutorial. So you can kind of pinpoint hotspots and then see uh, what's going on with those hotspots. So here is the basics on the visualization. So there's the original web page, just, which is the original web page. Then there's the positional heat map, which is the, you know, where are, you know, uh, in aggregate, if 100 people are trying this, or I don't know, a dozen people are trying this in a test, where are they spending their time? Um, and then what events are they, uh, are they doing at those places where they're hovering over those things? Um, you can filter by event. These are all the events that I said. Um, so you can kind of do a filter. You can fast it by events. Uh, you can slide this to like zoom in on a specific area to get more precision. There's a temporal heat map that just shows you know which times had a lot of events. So maybe people were stuck in the middle and they had a lot of lulls and stuff. Uh, here's an example of a, an error. This is a JavaScript error that uh, you know someone was trying to follow this JavaScript code in their IDE and they they like had some error. You know, they, they uh, you know, you know, they wrote some code and there's some error message down there and stuff. And so, you know, this is the idea that you're trying to follow along with a command line instruction or code and then some error gets thrown. So as an instructor, you might be like, oh, I didn't know that people were trying to do this, or I didn't know that this uh, weird Python error was coming up for half the students. It's because they're using the wrong version of Python, right? Um, so to evaluate this, we did this user study where we got, um, we took three widely used tutorials. So uh, there's a data science Python one, there is a web development one I showed, and there's a Git, uh, Git and GitHub one, and they're of increasing length. Um, so uh, these have been tested in like several classes, some MOOCs. Like a lot of people have used these tutorials. This is not just something we made up. Like these are actually heavily used. We got four CS students to come and follow each of the tutorials. So each one got four testers uh, with Porta, and then what we told students to do is uh, before they tried every tutorial, we had them kind of look over it. Before they were recording, we wanted them to see like what, you know, what they would improve about it, and then we, uh, sorry, sorry, we had them do the tutorial, right? Follow the tutorial, the porta, porta recorded all their stuff, and then we asked them after they followed the tutorial, what would you like to improve about the tutorial? Like, give us some feedback on it, and then they gave us some feedback, and then we had them play with the actual visualizations, and then see if they had any additional feedback after seeing that. And the creators did the same thing. So, each creator of the we had we knew the three creators. They reflect on their own tutorial without knowing about Fortis to say, like, look, look over your tutorial. What would you like to improve about this given that you've taught this class several times? And then they inspect the visualizations and then they um, reflect again. And, and we see if there's any difference in, in qualitatively what they say. So general findings were that, you know, most of the students went from kind of looks fine, like, yeah, I guess it's okay, to really specific and actionable feedback. So here's an example here. It's like, oh, in this place, there's no explanation of where event object for this click handle it comes from. So like there's extremely, extremely specific feedback that students give on their own sessions because they remember that, you know, they remember, oh wow, this part was really red. There's a bunch of weird error, you know, weird check mark that I'm gonna click on this and then reflect on what why did I have all the struggles in this part? And they, you know, they made suggestions for that. Um, all three creators again, very similarly, went from kind of vague ideas about yeah, I guess the tutorial could be improved this way to again very specific improvements. So like they're like, oh yeah, this Starting code blocks or code limits in the table. I guess this is a Python example, right? So it's like, oh, maybe I did talk about this. So several students got tripped up because of indentation here. So again, 
you know, the, the cool thing here is that everybody saw surprising behavior uh, despite these tutorials being, being heavily used before. And they were really surprised. And this kind of is an indication of this expert blind spot effect. It's like, I create the tutorial, I think this is great, and then when I actually can get feedback from students using it in a really compact way, I can actually see, oh, well, I, I probably didn't see this thing initially. Okay, so wrap up. Uh, last five minutes, I want to wrap up just kind of with, uh, with some final words here. Um, so what do these systems have in common, right? They, they kind of tackle very different problems, but they, the, the common thread here has been kind of visualizing state, right? So what the Python Tutor does is it visualizes code execution state in the small, very much in detail. Uh, DSJS visualizes this code and data linkage, right? Kind of connections between code and data. And then Porta visualizes learner activity, kind of visualizes the, uh, the process of someone going through a piece of code and tutorial and, and where they struggle. And I think in a lot of the work we've done visualization, a theme has been that I think these visualizations should act as scaffold, but they shouldn't hide the grimy details of, and realities of code. I mean, there's this temptation for, you know, to really abstract things out uh, visually, and I think that these visual environments can be good for certain kinds of design education elements, but I think, you know, for these kind of professional programmers needing to work with code, I think it's important to design these visualizations as supplements um, rather than as, as replacements, perhaps. And this goes back again to this theme of self-directed adults needing authentic tools situated within motivating, situated within motivating context, right? So like, Python Tutor got this really motivating context of this worldwide community of learners. The SJS, the context here was real web pages that people really were interested in. I really want to find out about sports because I like sports. Let's try to do some data analysis on sports right on the page. And part of the context is these are real tutorials that people are needing feedback on that, that are in the world. So these systems all kind of live within these motivating contexts. Now my final minute, I want to go back again to this, this horrendously messy slide. Um, so you know, if you kind of take all this in and you think, oh, this is, there's a lot of stuff here. You know, think about, you know, what would this look like in five years, <laughs> all right? Uh, chances are, you know, these, diver these, these exact terms will be kind of different. Uh, it might get more complicated, well, 10 years, well, 25 years. I mean, it's like, you know, it'd be foolish to try to predict what's going to happen in the next you know, quarter century, given that 25 years ago things looked so different. But here are some, you know, <laughs> just some vague ideas. Um, I think that you know, programming will become will involve more multilingual code. It already does, but I think it will just become more. Like knowing one language really well is just not going to cut it anymore. It's going to, you know, different pieces of languages, different DSLs are going to be for different settings. They're going to grow more reliant on data, right? All, you know, all this revolution of machine learning nowadays, it's all about data and interacting with code. And they're going to be for more complex environments. So this is, you know, programming is not going to be on desktop computer. I mean, no one even has, you know, desktop desktop. I mean, these are all laptops now, right? You're going to be programming these autonomous devices, programming our homes, right? All these things are distributed systems, ubiquitous computing systems, smart homes, self-driving cars, you know, scary or not, you know, people programming these things, making apps for these things, making interfaces, these things. And then even more scary, our own bodies, right? I mean, these devices, implantable devices are, are coming up and like, you know, uh, how much do you trust people who are programming these? Hopefully they have good tools for, you know, sets that's going to go inside people. So, you know, just thinking about the future of programming, it's going to be really be off the desktop. It's going to be all in these environments. And consequentially, programmers, they're going to need to be polyglots, right? They're going to have to be conversant with all different sorts of code, different sorts of languages. They're going to have to be data scientists. And they're going to have to be system administrators. Like, you know, when you're working at this level, you, you just can't get away from the systems in the environment and all this stuff. Um, you just have to be able to run kind of head on. And here's the paradox that I see, kind of the parting words here, is that, you know, there's been a lot of great efforts in the last decade, especially with this revitalization of computing education and real interest in making it really more accessible to more people. I think this is great. I've been following this uh, uh, along, you know, online learning, things getting kids into programming. It's, it's amazing, you know, making this more accessible in, in terms of just jobs, in terms of computational literacy. You know, I think it's just a great thing for the world. But what I see is that, like, as it becomes more and more accessible and more and more people can do this, which is great, more and more learners are going to run headlong into this cliff. And this is what I'm really afraid of, right? That, like, you're going to have, you have people from all, you know, from the studies that I've done, people from all sorts of different backgrounds, all sorts of different, um, you know, majors, fields, life experiences. You know, they, they're all getting into programming, but like they're more and more running into these, these abstraction cliffs that are really hard. And I think that these next generation of training tools really have to take this complexity head on. But I think we've done a really good job, you know, the, the community's done a really good job in the last 
uh, decade or two about building these kind of tools to help in very specific areas. But I think there's still a lot to be done with, um, with system integration and thinking about you know, all the stuff that people in, in software engineering and computing systems are thinking about, how do we transfer that to the learning side? I think that's, that's gonna be a big challenge the next decade. So again, I think you know, learning a code won't be enough. It, it, people really have to understand both uh, data and the environment. And this, you know, this talk really, you know, the, the, the real purpose of this talk really was to illustrate, I think, the problem, I think, and the challenge. And you know, these systems here are just kind of specific papers and specific stuff that my students and I did, but um, kind of first steps toward it. And um, yeah, I think it's almost three o'clock, and I'm happy to, to take questions this time around afterwards as well. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, any difference between teaching an adult and a kid to program? That's a great question. Yeah, so the question is about difference between teaching adults and kids. And yeah, there's, you know, there's a large literature on both of them. Um, you know, I don't do anything with kids, but I think that the, the high order bit is that I think with kids, you know, you don't actually perhaps need the authentic and realistic environment. So like, I think that, you know, one of the, you know, a lot of, so something that's really successful with kids are, are systems like Scratch, which are these blocks-based programming systems that uh, do storytelling and, um, and, and kind of being able to put stuff, you know, visual programming environments where you can have worlds and tell stories, and that's been tremendously successful with kids. And, you know, someone could argue, oh, this is not, you know, C++ or Python, but it actually doesn't matter. Because, you actually want them to understand algorithms and stories and processes. Whereas for adults, I think the big difference is that like they want to get some job done. So I think that would be the, the highest order bit divide is that for kids, the realistic environment is not necessarily necessary. And you might actually want a specific environment catered for kids. Whereas for, for adult learners, you know, these sorts of realistic environments are probably more essential. That's a really good question. Do you have one on this side? Uh, yeah. Uh, regarding the tools that you talked about, DS.js, so uh, I understand that it's quite a bit of data with that you have to work with. So what volumes of data can your tool expand? Oh, the, the scale of this thing? Um, it's <laughs> whatever browsers can handle. Um, it's, again, it's not meant for big data, right? So it's meant for whatever fits on the page. I mean, but you know, if, you, if you play with libraries like D3 and, um, and, and you know, JavaScript, you know, JavaScript, if you uh, even, yeah, even if you just write pure JavaScript, you can ingest probably you know, in the order of megabytes, right? I mean, even something like, I've seen stuff with you know, up to a million rows run in the browser just fine. Um, you know, you say like 10 to 100 megabytes probably runs fine. But yeah, it's probably not petabyte <laughs> scale. But yeah, it's, it's bigger than anything you would need for like just, you know, just playing on the web. Uh, yeah, back up. Hi, my name is Mustafa. Thanks Hi. for your talk. Great. I'm a PhD student here. I wanted to know what the word authentic means in the context where it's emphasized. Yeah, yeah, that's a great, yeah, I guess I should have clarified that. That's a bit of jargon. So, so the authenticity argument is sort of, um, it, it sort of goes back to the question about kids, right? So I, I should get a less jargony term for it. So what it means is that like, you know, I guess the DSJS thing is a good example. Like, you know, this is, yeah, in this context, like this is an authentic context because like the people who want to use this, we can imagine them using it on real web pages that they care about, right? That they that they're motivated by, like I'm motivated by sports, you're motivated by you know, the environment or by, by geography. Um, whereas a non-authentic context would be like the, you know, these kinds of uh, block space systems for kids, right? So they're non-authentic because you would never go and program something with that in the world, but it could actually be good also for say a kid's population. Um, but yeah, for these, I think the authenticity comes in like, these are real tutorials and web pages rather than say, we're making you into a, 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 you know, an artificial data environment. How is that different than from motivating context? Oh yes, um, I think I think they're pretty similar. I should probably reflect in the word. Yes, I don't think they're at odds with each other. I think I think they are pretty similar. Um, I should I should refine that sentence a bit. <laughs> but we talk afterwards about that. Okay, great. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I found Porta to be kind of an interesting tool, um, but I was wondering if you guys had ever explored like. So I noticed you have like a heat map kind of function where you explore like what parts of the page like people are stuck on. And I was wondering if you ever saw like if people were like taking certain keywords and maybe like searching them up externally. Because I feel like if you could see what other supplementary resources people are going to other than documentation, that might help with 
like improving the learning process on the original yeah. presentation? Yeah, yeah, so um, as part of this, because again, we trace all the browser activity, you can actually see if someone goes, um, I, I don't remember if my student was the one who ran all these studies, but like, you can actually see like here, here's an event, and they actually search for the string on Stack Overflow, and they actually jump to this other. So you can see, like, I'm on this tutorial, but I jumped to these three other websites, and like, we actually, you know, website visits, I think, is one, one type of thing. Yeah, we don't have a good visualization of that, but you can at least access that data. Yeah. Oh, should we do one more? Yeah. Um, how did you like seed or like get this out into the world or publicize for people to start using it? So I'm particularly curious about the. Yeah, yeah, that could be a whole talk. Okay, I, I have a whole talk just on this. Um, uh, it, a lot of it was just kind of incidental. I mean, a lot of it was just timing. It was just that, um, you know, around the time I was making this, it was toward the end of grad school, it was really that this online learning thing was taking off, and Python was a very popular language for learning. You know, a lot of these intro courses uh, were doing Python, so like, and it, you know, it searched well, I guess, on Google. But yeah, it was very organic. Like, there was not any. You know, if it hadn't taken off, I would have done other stuff, right? Like, it was extremely, extremely organic. Um, yeah, it was completely sort of an accident in a way. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to replicate it there. <laughs> okay. okay, well, uh, Philip is going to be around in the um, social hour, I guess, so he's, uh, you can talk to him a little bit more. Thank you, Philip. Thank you so much. Thank you.